Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Joshua Bennett, Marwa Halal, Ladan Osman, and Zandria Phillips, reading and discussing their award-winning poetry. Tonight's event is part of our ongoing virtual event series. As we remain digital for the time being, we're so excited to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our community during these difficult times, especially now it is through the support of authors and our beloved readers that we can continue to make events like this happen. So thank you so much for showing up for us week after week. For tonight's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A function wherever it may live on your Zoom display, where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase copies of tonight's featured titles. Ode, Invasive Species, Exiles of Eden, and Hull. If you already have copies of the books or would like to contribute to the series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you're able to extend to us at this time. Please note that closed captioning is available for this broadcast. Depending on which version of Zoom you are using, you may need to enable it yourself. Simply locate the button marked Live Transcript on your display and click through all the options. And one final note, as you have probably experienced during virtual gatherings this last year, technical issues might come up. If any glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and your understanding. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. In addition to being one of our favorite customers, Joshua Bennett is a performer, is a poet, performer, and professor of English and creative writing at Dartmouth College. He is the author of two poetry collections, tonight's featured title, Ode and The Sobbing School, winner of the National Poetry Series, as well as a book of criticism, Being Property Once Myself, Blackness and the End of Man. His writing has been published in the New York Times Magazine, the Paris Review, Poetry and Elsewhere. Marwa Halal is an award-winning poet and journalist. She is the author of the chapbook, I Am Made to Leave, I Am Made to Return, An Invasive Species, and has appeared in venues including Hyper Allergic, the Offing, Poets and Writers, and Winter Tangerine. Halal is the winner of Bomb Magazine's biennial 2016 poetry contest and has been awarded fellowships from Poets House, Brooklyn Poets, and Cave Khan. Ladan Osman, Somali-born poet and essayist, is the author of The Kitchen Dweller's Testimony, winner of the Sil Silverman First Book Prize, the chapbook Ordinary Heaven, and tonight's featured title, Exiles of Eden. For her work, Featured widely in journals including Apogee, The Normal School, Prairie Schooner, and Waxwing. She has been awarded numerous fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center, Cave Canum, and the Missionary Center. Lastly, Zandria Phillips is a poet and visual artist. They are the author of tonight's feature title, Hull, winner of the 2020 Lambda Literary Award, and Reasons for Smoking, winner of the 2016 Seattle Review Chapbook Contest, judged by Claudia Rankin. Their work is featured or forthcoming from Virginia Quarterly Review. Black Warrior Review, Crazy Horse, West Branch, and elsewhere. Tonight, these amazing writers, recently named the recipients of the prestigious Whiting Award for Poetry, have joined us for a discussion of and reading from their award-winning collections. Across the praise heaped on these brilliant poets and their work, a common vocabulary emerges. Many of them have at times been called expansive, incisive, imaginative, formally superb, and emotionally resplendent. Their poems, which both span and collapse notions of identity, generation, alienation, are as attuned to a poem's capacity to express as they are to its obligation to witness. We have so much beautiful work to listen to, so without further ado, I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Joshua, Sandria, Marwa, and Laban. Thank you, Benjamin, for that beautiful introduction and for the shout out. Harvard Books are definitely one of my favorite spots on earth. Uh, to come back to the literature I love. So thank you for that. And thank you to the homies, my friends and colleagues, the present collective of geniuses for sharing the space with me. I'm excited to be in conversation with you all. Uh, and the first poem I'm gonna read is the second to last poem I read the last time I saw Marwa in person. So this is Benediction. God bless the lightning bolt in my little brother's hair. God bless our neighborhood barber the patience it takes to make a man you've just met beautiful. God bless every beautiful thing called monstrous since the dawn of a colonizer's time. God bless the arms of the mother on the crosstown bus, 
the sterling silver cross at the crux of her collarbone, its shine barely visible beneath her nightshade navy, New York Yankees hoodie. God bless the baby boy kept precious in her embrace. His wail turning my entire role into an opera house. God bless the vulnerable ones. How they call us toward love and its infinite unthinkable cost. God bless the flaws, the flash, the brash and bare knuckle brawl of the South Bronx girls who raised my mother to grease knuckles, cut eyes, get fly as any fugitive dream on the lamb, on the run from the law, as any and all of us are who dare to wake and walk in this skin. And you best believe God bless this skin, the shimmer and slick of it, the wherewithal to bear the rage of sisters, brothers slain and still function each morning, still sit at a desk, send an email, take an order, dream a world, some heaven big enough for Black life to flourish, to grow. God bless the no. My story is not for sale. The no, this body belongs to me and the earth alone. The sea, the thing about souls is they by definition cannot be owned. God bless the beloved flesh. Our refusal calls home. God bless the unkillable interior. Bless the uprising. Bless the rebellion. Bless the overflow. God bless everything that survives the fire. This next poem, like benediction, uh, is from a long sequence in the new book, The Study of Human Life. And it's apropos because before this, Xandra and I were talking about trash. So this is trash. Not the poem itself, but the title of it, in my estimation. Trash. Saturdays, it was my job to pick the bones from cans of fish, which became the unwieldy piles of pink flesh that, once fried, became the cakes we ate for dinner that night, breakfast the next day, dinner again to close the loop. Decades passed before I saw the beast in real time, realized, like Baldwin, who once saw his mother lift a yard of velvet, say, this is a good idea, and for months thought ideas were shocks of black fabric. That salmon lived outside the bounds of food town shelves we searched for deals in the early 90s. Supermarket circulars held tight in our two small hands, armaments against American cost. Older now, a literary type with insurance to boot, I tell this story to my lover at our kitchen table, unsure of what I am trying to convey exactly. Something about the flexible nature of human knowledge, perhaps, a speed course in semiotics over poached eggs, or maybe some version of the same tale I am always telling, that the wall between the world and me grew weaker once I left what I loved. Children of the poor, their small words and smaller sense of scale. Back then, life on earth was Yonkers, New York, and my grandmother's salon. Every leather bound book was a word of God. And there I was, an affront to history, creative even in my ignorance, sketching planets in the air as my big sister sang soul outside my bedroom window, her voice like something ancient and winged, pulling summer into being. Oh, nice. All right. Hmm. I wasn't gonna read this poem, but I'm going to now because I got the chance to see my barber yesterday and he's great. This is Barber's song. Postmodern blackness blacksmith, straight razor reshaping self-esteem. You dream in geometries unreachable by any other means. Speak and entire phrases abandon standard American etymology. Hence, you liberate waves from the sea corn rose from the cornfield, reclaim fade, so I now hear the word and imagine only abundance. Caesar never meant anything to me, but a cut so close you could see the shimmer of a man's thinking. You are how we first learned to bend language built to unmake us, accept implausible risk, some much older man, shaver in hand like a baton full of wasp gossip, asking, with the grain or against. And the question feels damn near existential. 
given this is the only place we can live in such thoughtless proximity to another person's open hands, be held by the face, ask outright to be made glamorous, shaped by your polymathic brilliance, you bi-weekly psychoanalyst, first stop before funeral, before wedding and block party alike, you soothsayer, cooing children to calm as they sit in the chair for the first time, as still a storm as one might reasonably expect. You ethicist, defending hairlines at all cost, your vigilance keeping online and otherwise slander at bay. Philosopher King, the source in the drawer, dominoes and scotch and barbasol adorning your countertop right above the chorus line of clippers swaying to the clamor of checkmates and offhand insults now filling the shop, each moving as if the unfettered locks of some great metal monster, some faraway watcher, and you, guardian of it all, clean as a pope. I write about hair a lot. And some of it, I think, is that my grandmother was a cosmetologist, which is I've written elsewhere. It was one of my favorite words as a boy because uh, it reminded me of both uh, comic books and comets, which were my favorite things when I was seven years old. I would also get paid a dollar by the women in the shop if I could spell words that were longer than three syllables. So recalcitrance, malfeasance, loquacious, those are my go-tos if I wanted to buy some Swedish fish or something like that. So this is from my grandmother who, uh, who passed at the top of the pandemic, may she rest, Charlotte Elizabeth Ballard. And this is a ode to the plastic on your grandmother's couch, which could almost be said to glisten or glow like the weaponry in heaven, frictionless as if slickened with some pesticontal auntie's last bottle of anointing oil, an ark of no covenant one might easily name apart from the promise to preserve all small and distinctly mortal forms of loveliness that any elder African-American woman makes the day they see 60. Consider the garden of collards and heirloom tomatoes only, her long single braid streaked with gray like a gathering of weather, the child popped in church for not sitting still, how even that, they say, can become an omen if you aren't careful. If you don't act like you know, all Newton's laws don't apply to us the same exactly. Ain't no equal and opposite reaction to the everyday brawl blackness in America is. No body so beloved, it cannot be destroyed. So we hold on to what we cannot hold, adorn it in Vaseline or gold or polyurethane wrapping. Call it ours and don't mean owned. Call it just like new, mean, alive. My last poem uh, also has my grandma in it, but uh, it's for my son, August Galileo, who's downstairs as we write this. Uh, he was born, turns one years old uh, in 11 days. And so his first birthday party is this weekend and he was born in a pandemic. So this is a poem about that, but it's also, I guess, about the forms of love that persist uh, beyond what we can imagine or ask for. So this is dad poem, ultrasound number two with a line from Gwendolyn Brooks. Months into the plague now, I am disallowed entry even into the waiting room with mom, escorted outside instead by men armed only with guns and bottles of hand sanitizer, their entire countenance, its own American metaphor. So the first time I see you in full force, I am pacing maniacally up and down the block outside, FaceTiming the radiologist and your mother too, her arm angled like a cellist to help me see. We are dazzled by the sight of each bone in your feet, the pulsing black archipelago of your heart, your fists in front of your face like mine when I was only just born, 10 times as big as you are now. Your great grandmother calls me Tyson the moment she sees this pose, prefigures a boy built for conflict, her barbarous and metal little man. She leaves the world, only months after we learn you are entering into it. In her mind, the year before that. In the dementia's final days, she envisions herself as a girl of 17, running through fields of strawberries, unfettered as a kingfisher. I watch her stance 
and imagine her laughter echoing back across the ages, you, her youngest descendant born into freedom, our littlest burden lifter, world beater, avant-garde percussionist, swinging darkness into song. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. I could have listened to Joshua read for, you know, another few minutes here. So caught me a little off guard, but so grateful to be sharing this space and having a kind of celebration for ourselves. Um, you know, since the award, uh, you're all just such great poets and I'm so lucky to be in your company, um, but also to teach your work and, and, you know, also use it as a clapback <laughs> every once in a while um, or to teach form uh, or breath and syntax, all these things that we put into the poems. And uh, I always like to share this little ditty about how me, Joshua, and Zan shared uh, space at Cave Canem when a lot of these baby poems were just babies. And um, I'm gonna start with poem to be read from right to left, which Zan actually uh, was the first to publish in Winter Tangerine. Poem to be read from right to left. I learned my first language second, C, C, Native I am mistaken for, everywhere I go. To sun and moon, like the letter lamb. Sound like lamb, but think like fox. Reminds me of this recurring dream, being chased in a circle, like duck, duck, goose. But there were no other children. I got tired of counting the number of English words it takes to capture one and another. Poem that wrote me into beast in order to be read. Samira and Aziza, Nabila Awatif and Adel, Isis and Mat, yes Mat, of the 42 laws and ideals we used to live by. You of white feather and commandment who made us, taught us of stars and named them, named us, made newt and systems of irrigation. Nile, Delta source inventors, of mead and goh for drawing of lapis and woven cloth. Harp, Sinai, Berber, pen and paper. We were winged creatures, weren't we? Tell me, because I still dream of flight. Sometimes I trumpet waiting to be sound. I, who have made earrings of arrow, reporting now to you of the mythical creatures I dismantled in order to become the one writing words you are reading. Tarsal by metatarsal, I disjointed false to be true. Sometimes I am cell with eyes made up of five strand DNA, quintuple helix amoeba bond. I would claim you as my ancestors thrice, but once is honor. I'm trying to be worthy, live to have learned so much that God made Arab to know what it is to be both black and Jew. To be Arab is to beast in order to be read. Like scripture, etched calligraphy, wooden metal, I ask you to marvel at poetry they tried to make us forget in Guantanamo and all unnamed time will ask us of this time, come back again and again. While we were out, the world has become image we made in our own image. And this is what we hunt. Now I've caught my reflection between incisors. I, beast of no nation who want only to be read. Excuse me, now it is time to be fed. Poem for palm pressed upon pain. I am in the back seat, my father driving from Mansoura to Cairo, Delta to desert, Heliopolis, a path he has traveled years before I was born. The road has changed, but the fields are same, same, biblical green, hazy green. When I say, this is the most beautiful tree I have ever seen. And he says, 
all the trees and moss are the most beautiful. This is how I learned to see. We planted pines four in a row for privacy, for property value. That was Ohio, before New Mexico, before I would make must my own. But after my mother tells me to stop asking her what is wrong whenever I see her staring out of the living room window. This is how trauma learns to behave, how I learn to push against the page. I always give Hatem the inside seat so he can sleep on the bus, his warm cheek against the cold window. When I'm old enough to be aware of leaving, it is raining hard, 5,000 miles away. There is a palm in a pot, its leaves pressed, skinny neck bent, a plant seeking light in an animal kingdom. Yeah. Man, I'm flying to Egypt every day these days, so forgive me, I really miss it. <laughs> um, I'm trying to like take all of uh, next semester off so I can just not be here for a while. And I know y'all <laughs> know what I mean. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, it's a privilege to take a break from this place, but yeah, the homesickness is like new levels that I can't even begin to describe, but that's what the books are for, right? All right. Let's move on to something a little bit later. Let's see. Oh, come on, don't do that. Gotta talk to it sometimes. You got the keys, keys, keys. An ode to DJ Khaled. You so naive, you sophisticated. You so spiritual, told Larry King, you pray 10 times a day, more than 10 times a day. You pray in your head all the time. Now all the Muslim boys have a new line to impress the uncles with. Must be why you so fire, even water tried to claim you. Remember when you got lost on a jet ski in the dark? That shit got what, like a billion some hits? Snapchat should be paying you. Instagram should be paying you so you can put that money in a savings account. Buy your mama a house. Buy your whole family houses. You a hero riding in on a lion, watering your garden, talking to flowers. We make memes of you like when they want to ban Palestinians, but then they would have to recognize Palestine. I quote you in classrooms. Congratulations, you played yourself. And when the kids laugh, I tell them, you a genius, I appreciate you, you loyal, you, you on one and another one. We the best. Because of you, I know I can put the hinges on the hands too. Your voice smooth like olive oil from the holy land. Beautiful, long-lashed, dark-eyed, heavy-browed with the beard made of our ancestors' dreams. You're a version of the man I was raised to, raised to want but could never stand to be with. Still, I appreciate you for what you undo. The bricks in Amsterdam know your beats. Heard you bumping with Drake in Paris streets. Wheezy and you riding through downtown Cairo smog and your outro fade like London fog. You so international, the kids in Tel Aviv throw back my ties to no new friends. And nearby, the Palestinians depke until they forget they are Palestinian or rather until they forget they are occupied. Yours is the rhythm they rebuild to. What do you say we give them all the keys, major keys, back to their rightful homes? Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's interesting to try and um, make space for um, each reading and for the feeling of applause and celebration. So thank you so much, Amara, for sharing with us, Joshua as well. Um, I don't know. I am very moody these days, but I'm just thinking a lot about what it means to, to show up 
and to try things <laughs> um, and to love or attempt to love at um, what is more and more described as and maybe appears to be the end of the world as we understand it, um, especially in thinking about just like climate change and the structures that have carried us through or appear to carry us through different times. And so, yeah, that's just on my mind. Um, and so I'm gonna read one poem from the first book um, just cause I feel like it. And then I'll read some more like lusty poems maybe, but in a complicated way because it seems like the time for you know, harvest and planting seeds and things. And so maybe that will help <laughs> my moodiness a little bit. Maybe it'll increase my moodiness, I don't know. So this is Woman, Ego, Shadow. Now I go into a brown sleep and look for myself. The last time I tried to see her, I dreamed a white cricket. Its chirp was deafening. It survived the fire and disappeared. Who has taken myself? When she was with me, dream was a mug with a chipped rim, concrete against the lip, sand in the teeth. We never swallowed the missing pieces. She was firmly affixed on a path. She drank boiling tea and said, girl, girl, how come I got so much middle luck? Me and myself are two flames following a line of gunpowder. We race, combine, then extinguish. Me and myself are trees, ashen roots, and the sidewalk that boxes us in. Me and myself are dial tone ringing out into the street. Me and myself are a small house, poor but not mean. She is the tall window that shows a bed and an open wardrobe. I am the young man considering t-shirts and jerseys. She is the woman who looks up at him from the street. I am the rat that runs eager in the yard. Me and myself have been raping each other for a long time. Myself prefers a boot on the back of my neck so all the neighbors can see her try to make me pray to the pavement. Where has she packed her purse and gone off to this time? She could never tell if she would take the train north or south until she frowned and let it pass or sat by the window. Myself used to hear everything wrong. She'd say, them Gulf Coast men was bullied and harnessed by their bosses. But then the wrong music was better if it whistled from her. She'd say, the wolves been biting just to taste or the caterpillars are denuding their homes. A tree's privates are the loneliest place. Myself burned her palm into my back. When I turn to see if she's there, she goes. I am looking for myself. If you fall asleep on the couch and see her, tell her I have a knife for the place between her shoulder blades. Tell her I said you lie so good, you make the ocean sweet. Tell her I said something standing by my bedside and I know it ain't her. Tell her my sleep is usually navy blue or even green and gold and I want it browner than knees or butt cheeks. Tell her something that tastes like tea with grit in it. Tell her I put poison in the pot and intend to watch her drink it while she's telling me something crazy. Tell her I'm out of breath. Tell her there's a paw, the weight of a large stone on my chest. Tell her I've seen the moon come red out of blackness. Tell her the sand is rising as one people and rushing somewhere. Tell her she's missing all my wildness. And if she doesn't come on soon, I'll have to go looking for my shadow. And myself knows shadows the kind who don't take her shoes off for nobody. Now the silence, like that vacuum is actually perfect for that. <laughs> 
just like feels like being in outer space or something. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna read from Exiles of Eden. Uh, I don't know, like I feel like even my, can you have lust without the carnage, without the recognition of the things that are kind of lying in the field next to rot and new life? I don't really know. So my poems will always include that. I'm often thinking about various kinds of flooding. I'm thinking about Katrina. I'm thinking about water rising and ice melting. And that's been the case for, you know, since they were trying to, like when I was trying to get a world wildlife fund, like backpack or something as a kid, and things just got so much more uh, intense and terrifying in ways that I wasn't ready for. I don't think there's any way to be ready for it. Like we don't have a good reference point. So, uh, but still there's love and still there's desire. And so that's, there are a lot of moments like that. Oh, I think anyway, in Exiles of Eden. And so this is the sea fell on my house. I was sweeping and counting my cups and rinsing my toothbrush and bracing my hinges when the sea fell on my house. The sea fell on my house when I'd braced for a straight line wind. The sea fell on my house and I couldn't tell if it jumped on me or me in it, but I was filled with the minerals and matter every beast and root on earth contained. I couldn't tell if it jumped in me or me in it, but I watched it fall out of my body, warm seawater from my body onto the kitchen floor. I just checked for the earth dust of winter, the brown dust of winter. When you enter with it, don't say may, say can, can I? And I'll answer with a gesture, cover me with your body. In the atmosphere between our ribs, rain. Rain containing the minerals and salve every beast and root on earth. Cover me and cover my cries. My mouth a cave for the sea to rush through. Your tongue some urchin assigned to live off my minerals and matter. Later, when delinquent refused to move, your belly at rest, your belly a palm on my belly. Refuse to move until another train passes and I'll say no with a gesture. The sea fell on my house. The sky was paper white, just afternoon, an exact white, winter salt crests and froth on the sidewalks. That should have been a warning that the sea would fall, not the real one. Sorry, I gotta run that back. <laughs> that should have been a warning that the sea would fall, the real one not the sad sea of a snow mound resisting spring. The real one fell on my house. I couldn't tell if pressure was at the front of my mind or if my mind got stopped up underwater. The sea fell, the sea fell, the sea fell on me and I'm at ease and thirsty and a figure is made known. A figure made from all the minerals and matter of his fellow beasts, the roots he eats. We are thirsty and at ease and falling asleep to the mineral scent of our contribution to the sea. We are thirsty and at ease, and the chalk and film of the sea is dry on our thighs and fingers and in the juvenile curve under our lips. We are thirsty and at ease. 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 And mindful of our salt and thirsty and at ease and resting and assured of the yield will mine. So, last poem. Has some disruptive images, but you know, when people are like, that's creepy. I remember a mentor of mine was like, life is creepy. It's like, yeah, that's actually true. So um, yeah, same kind of theme so, though, like how to make a ceremony of everyday life and how to love through grief and so many of these poems I was writing when like you know alone in certain ways um, much like I am now actually so maybe that's why I'm returning to them and so this is NSFW I want us to get off before this screen sleeps I want to make a video and play it on a loop let it ruin someone's dinner I want to tell you 
I had a nightmare about Oscar Grant's murder before it happened. I want you to believe me and turn me over and over. Say this hole, this one, cover them all. Fill my mouth so I stop tasting blood. I want to dream we're miniature people on a watermelon rind, rocking, rocking. I wanna walk into a field at night, close our eyes and mouths so the searchlights can't find us. I want you to hold me in the grass and later point at the drowned ants, our hides raw from mosquito bites. I want you to recite your lineage. Let us make formal prayers for the names we forget, for the ones that history took. Let us pray from the heart for the blood they took from us. I wanna give you my history of blood, of dirt, of police, of teachers, of social workers, then laugh with all our teeth showing. I want you to time travel and make cards and bracelets for the little girl who watched A Time to Kill and never healed. I want you to braid my hair and really mess up. I want you to braid my hair and make perfect parts. I want to preside over the new African, I want to preside over the new Pan-African Congress between sessions, daydream of my honeysuckle drying in your beard. I wanna feel you with my hand or foot under the welcome table. I want you to bring me to incoherence. I want to keep you up and ride into levity. I wanna sing, I get so weak in the knees, off key, my voice hoarse from screaming. I wanna sing all the breakdowns and know their meanings. I want us to get caught in one of Diana's closets in her silks and satins. I wanna play our parents' records with our eyes closed, smile and sway like Stevie. I want us to procreate ourselves, thereby knowing our folks, finally. I want us to stay home as the others build babble or turn to rubble. I want to be Sheba revealing her ankles ready to wade in water. I want to wade in mine. I want to go until our biology stops us. I want to almost go too far then stop since Obamacare isn't as comprehensive as he'd hoped. I want you to steal all my oil so you can smell like a shaman too. Let's wear linens and visit the pharaohs and scare people. I want you to croon Wyclef's 911 and let me rub your back and what shows when your pants are sagging. I want to hum a change is going to come with you in my mouth. I want you against the hot and breathing grill of a truck or cop car. I want you to cry falsetto tears if I start to leave you, better run to me like the first 17 seconds of Donnie's A Song For You. I want to take a beat for our parents' pain, then give them moody grandchildren. I want to wake looking like Edward Scissorhands shaped my afro. I want you to minister to me in the morning. Pull us under the comforter so all so the neighbors and the walls and our devices can't hear and call each other by our secret names. Gasp, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Thank you. Evan, that was so beautiful. Um, Thank you. And it made me change what I wanted to read because I got so excited. Um, I'm going to read a horny poem. So uh, just thank you for that. I mean, it was much more than a horny poem, but my God, my God. Um, well, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I want to start by saying that. Thank you, Joshua. Um, I'm just really excited um, to be reading with y'all. Um, I've admired all of your work for so long. It just feels really special to be here and be acknowledged with you. Um, and that being said, my first poem will be of four, I'm just gonna read four poems, uh, will be Ode to a Vibrator Left On All Night. Um, in her absence, my hunger for hum and throttle took me by sweltering longitude. With the right to claim shotgun, I drove a stick through the streets of Osu while a man steered, yielding to clutch, pressing us further into night. I know well the sound, engines purring plea for shift, 
and my hands the abundance of submission. I withheld nothing. I want when I want, and then I wish for corrosion. Though I cannot lavish praise on stamina alone, I must acknowledge a femme fortitude. Last night, I tell myself a misstep at battery's expense, so as to never consider the sentience of a pleasure machine. How her trembling must have lullabied my drunk tongue, the intricacies of sexual decorum, even in sleep. How she may have throbbed all night beside me, anticipating her own reciprocal and tender invasion. Um, I forgot to mention that that uh, that poem was from my book, Hull. I'll be reading one more from my book and then I'm going to read um, some newer work. Uh, my second uh, Hull poem is called Social Death in the Dress. I write to you from the predicament of blackness. You see, I've been here all my life and found on the atomic level, it's impossible to walk through most doorways. I can, however, move through walls. I write to you from the empty seat that isn't empty. I write to you when a feel is copped. I write myself out of bed. I write to you as the spook who sat by the door. I write to you from Olivia Pope's A Political Mouth. I am here because I could never get the hang of body death, though it has been presented to me like one would offer a roofied cocktail or high interest loan. I am only here because I started eating again. I am only here because I am ineligible to exist otherwise. I am only here because I left and returned through an Atlantic wormhole. I write to you as the American version of me. In the American version, Orpheus's liar is a gun. Eurydice thinks of doctors or rather a cold hand. It feels like one is sliding its sterile nails over the curtains of her room. Once a healer's hands passed through my flesh and I went on trial for stealing 10 fingers. When my spoon scrapes the bottom of a bowl, it sounds like a choir of siblings naming stars after their favorite meals. Physicists are classifying new matters and energies every day. Dark matter, black flesh are in high demand and we never see a penny. I urge you, if you see a sister walk through walls or survive the unsurvivable, sip your drink and learn to forget or love the text apparition before you. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna read two more. Um, it's from a project I'm working on that I guess most easily summarized is about television and blackness uh, often. But uh, this first poem is called Film Theory. A character I love dies and I am ruined. Things that haven't happened hurt me considerably. Hurt me considerably and I'll act like nothing happened. Nothing happened, but I expired on the cellular level. Cell death corresponds to an intangible loss. Intangible loss is fiction's cornerstone. I corner fiction for a confession. I'm not real, none of this is. Fiction cannot unplant an image, it can only corrupt it. Film corrupts an image at 24 frames per second. When an image corrupts a body, we call this character. A character wears a body, not the other way around. A body wears shame, its own or a director's. Anything that contradicts a director, they cut. A cut is a place where I have been severed from myself. A character is a version severed from itself. A version deceased withers on its person. So um, this last poem, I would like to dedicate to my friend who's here in the audience, Johanna. Um, this is, I never thought I would write a crown of sonnets. Um, honestly, I just thought, eh, not for me. But then um, I was trying to figure out how to write a poem to my favorite character in Westworld and a crown of sonnets was the only way somehow. So this is called Bernard Lowe in Five Movements. 
everything is fine once you forget yourself in the current of sleep, wet, elaborate stream of self. Your day has been one of many in a procession. Who you really are only comes to you in enigmatic blips blurring into a conjoined omen. You are Nella Larson's passing. You are John, His John Henry's blister. Your dreams are without myth. A son you've never met dies and you follow him into the soil. Have you ever questioned the nature of your reality? Your substratum pulses, its instrument too ingrained to pluck. Extraction would take something vital with it. Extraction would take something vital with it is what you think when you remember a fragment of code or exquisite memory traces. Last night before sleeping, she was at your door, hungry for your oblation off the clock. You know this dance, but only as you commit to moving through its physical vocabulary. This is when you feel most like unscripted flesh. In you, they planted an ache where memory grows, so you are worked as a field is. You're not ready to extricate yourself from her. She's making that face you love. Again, so concerned, and you make a mental note to write a gesture as subtle as her. To write a gesture as subtle as her, you must let your work consume you by the molecule, trope by trope. Hosts have been acting out, acting real. So have you, and despite your docility, a higher order has moved your hand against her. She is missing and so are you for the most part. It's difficult to remember where you were. When you forget to remember, you hear her voice asking, what's behind that door? How your mind anticipates the rod of allegory and apprehends. You sleepwalk with a white hand on the back of your neck until one night your palming blueprints of your likeness and the weight of the moon is unbearable. The weight of the moon is unbearable. It feels like water in your ears when you learn the machinery of your new reality. To live among humans, you've forgotten all your unnatural gifts. How you are an arrangement, not a coincidence. How you've bloomed so well, no one could clock your leatherette amid the hide. Such brutality is memory. You can't stay present, and you certainly cannot stay here in its ruins, fumbling your authenticity in the dark. All this time, you've merely been revving the engine of your will. You are lethal, and for too long, you've walked as a shadow must. For too long, you've walked as a shadow must, adhering to life in the periphery. Tonight, you plan to grab a gun and do something utterly human. For the first time, you feel the difference between lust and arrows, the latter being the metal cool in your hot hand before you shove the gun into your pocket. Another man built you to be the progenitor of his grief, and now it's time to end yours. You know you can begin again. You aren't mortal after all. You're more than bone and anamnesis, and for once, you're awake. Everything is new. Everything is fine once you forget yourself. Thank you. Wow. One more quick round of applause for all the poets. I'll clap louder, but it's about to be my son's bedtime. So I don't wanna wow out. That was fantastic. Okay, we got about, let's just say like seven to 10 minutes, even though that's not necessarily correct, but it's fine. We're in Black time right now, so we're going to do our thing. I'm going to read two of these questions from the Q&A section for everyone, if that's all right. And I'll start with the last one. In another Harvard Bookstore talk, the brilliant writer Tina Camp talked about on the topic of writing what she loved, that she was rarely writing about her subjects, but was instead writing towards them. What do you all feel like you are writing towards? A good question. I feel like, well, I'll just start if that's cool. I feel like I'm writing towards, in the poems at least, the textures and sounds of the people I actually grew up around, if that makes sense, right? Like Sylvia Winter has this beautiful line where she says that she wants to write the way Aretha Franklin sang. And I think part of what I'm trying to write towards or write like 
is um like the sound of my mom like yelling to wake me up while Motown is in the background on Saturday because it was my turn to clean and like the way it sounded on the block in the summer with people playing tag and the hydrants running and people doing double dutch like I actually want to capture that texture in the work and I want to represent too I think the the ethics and the politics of black social life in those spaces right the way that a certain kind of meditative tenacity persists in the midst of great destruction and that what some people call oblivion I think is actually quite rich and I think I'm always after that in the poems I think since I was very small that's what I've been trying to not capture in the work but but set free right life as I knew it and as I'd seen it and as I'd seen it misrepresented pretty much almost everywhere else around me so I think that's what I'm, I'm writing toward um that sound that sensibility What about y'all? The question is too good. It's too good. Um, I feel like I am writing towards time. Um, the way I think about time is kind of like, I think I'm always trying to do a circle, but it just depends if I go towards the future or towards the past um, first. And I think my first book was very much taking the long route to the future by going through the past. Um, and right now I'm trying to go the opposite way and write a bit more into the future and hopefully find my ass back in the past uh, through that route. Yeah, my internet is a little shaky. So just uh, let me know if I, you know, disappear, you can't hear me or anything, but I really, love this answer the what Joshua said as part of his answer um about oblivion being a really rich place especially when you come from cultures that have been made to feel like a kind of oblivion it's kind of like so <laughs> you know like you you know back to that Toni Morrison quote of you know you're always trying to prove something and it's you know I, I would rather lean into that oblivion and I think about it a lot um especially thinking about all the myths about our culture and like how we get hung up on the myth and forget that the myth comes from you know a truth some truth that needed to be passed on um, through story, through poem. But I think what I'm writing towards now is connecting as many languages as I possibly can. So really like taking the vernacular thought, you know, to an, a new place um, where like all the languages kind of become one in a sense uh and that really comes from egyptian arabic like that idea of um cannibalizing if you will all the other colonizing languages and like bringing them into that oblivion right like that that kind of an idea so okay um this is a solid question and there have already been three solid answers. So um, I would just say maybe less for me, like toward a particular thing, but maybe in and through faith and understanding faith as just um, that not knowing has its richness, that there's something worthy in just the effort and the journey and the yearning. Um, and that there will be some place to land, you know, even if you just kind of like land in a tumble or, or you're in um, bewilderment. Like I actually have placed a lot of value and it's, it's writing books that actually taught me that and grappling with trying to edit a book that taught me that is that there's a lot of value in bewilderment, that there's a lot of richness in, in being lost or feeling lost, that well, what kind of lost person are you? Are you someone who's gonna like look for clues? Are you gonna panic? Are you gonna sit and wait? 
are you going to believe that you can rescue yourself or that there's a way to move forward or beyond a place of confusion? And so uh, I can definitely identify with, um, you know, the, the comment, the thinking anyway, that's in the question, but maybe from like a slightly different angle. That's fantastic. All right, well, one more to close us out. It's a complex one, but I like it. If you could be any song, what song would you be? And I feel like I have an answer for this that's weird. I don't know that I would want to be a song. I mean, right after reading this, I thought about being a song and it, it feels kind of terrifying, right? Because you, you never know where you're going to be invoked, like in what situation for how long. But if I could tap into the feeling of any particular song at will, like in its fullness, probably Aretha Franklin, Rocksteady, um, or Sam Cooke, You Send Me, if it's not just the feeling of the song, but also the lyrics. I've always loved that idea that uh, love was like a kind of teleportation. And I, I feel like that to me is one of the best kinds of short hands for adoration I've ever come across, is saying that someone or something sends you. So yeah, that's what I'm going with, Sam Cooke and Aretha. Easy way out, but I don't care. What about y'all? I have one, I'm nervous to say it. This is like a great uh, question. I think like y'all just don't drag me for this, please. Um, but I think like, hi. Locked in here. Go ahead, we're listening. Put <laughs> it's nap time. It is nap time. Um, <laughs> Um, it would be uh, In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins. I just feel like that song is like, I love drumming. I also love faking people out. And there's that part where you always think it's gonna start, but it isn't starting yet. Um, I just like the atmospheric quality, like literally the intangibility of it. It's just a feeling, you know? I think I'd like to be that song if I could be a song, but um, yeah, In the Air Tonight. Yeah, I have inside knowledge uh, that Zan's partner really loves that song also, which is like, this is very cute. And I, I do get to drag you a little bit. Sorry, I couldn't resist. You, you sort of set that up. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. For me, it's like, there's so many songs uh, and I'm in agreement. It's like, yeah, like <laughs> now that you mentioned it, Joshua, I wasn't like thinking about it like that, but yeah, like I'm not trying to be in some situation that I definitely didn't sign up for, but um, I think mine is going to have to be uh, Muhammad Munir. I'll actually put this in the chat as an answer, um, but the, the title of the song translates to My Heart is the People's Homes, but it's like, that's like a very clean translation um because it's like really uh referring to like the slums or like like what we call favelas or you know just the where poor people live um and I want to be that song because the form of it is like a shell so it's like you know like you're in the country and then you just keep going in and in it's just like any kind of place that has a lot of tourism like where I'm from, um, it's like, you just keep working your way in, 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 until you get to where the poor people live. And that's where you find the country, like for real. So that's the song. Um, yeah, also a solid question, but just like aggressively hard question. I don't know how to say her name because I've never heard anybody say it. So I do apologize. It might be Love and Affection by Joan Armitrading. I don't know how to say her name. I think she's a Caribbean, like British uh, singer, songwriter that they used to call St. Joan, which is also perfect and interesting. Um, but maybe like a fast, I, I don't know, because I, I think that it can never be one song. It's just, I need the chaos of multiple songs and also just like, 
starting a new song before the first one is up but that one is beautiful and has a lot of tones and it's so earnest and I like that a lot um and uh, I don't know if we're bothering like like how we're doing this or like if we're just like doing like bothering the bookstore <laughs> by going over but I did want to say for the person who asked the question about the um what's the first thing you do when an idea just appears in your head I mean I just if I can't hold it and repeat it to myself and remember that as a kind of refrain, I do just write it down, like just in my notes app. I scribble things down, like I don't care about whatever errand or thing that I'm doing. There's almost always time or space to, to record because to me, that's one of the most irritating feelings ever is <laughs> that I had a strong thought and one that I want to pursue and it just floated away. And now I have to wait a while for it to come back if it ever even comes back. And so I like, I personally like to avoid that <laughs> feeling. No, that's fantastic. I think a perfect note. Benjamin, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, well, thank you once again, all of you for this fantastic reading. Thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us. Please learn more about the Incredibles featured books um, and purchase your copies at harvard.com. I've put each of the books in the chat a couple times. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your week. Keep reading and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you.